Well, if you didn't think there was complexity, you've just heard more. And uh, uh, anyone who can solve this, I'm sure, will be uh, <laughs> welcomed. But it's, it's not exactly easy. So um, now we have our, our fourth panelist. And, and uh, I, th I think uh, uh, Professor Bothwell is very well known at the University of Toronto. Um, and, and so uh, he probably needs no introduction to most of you. But nevertheless, we will note that he was educated at the University of Toronto and Harvard. And he's a professor of history. Uh, he's the author of more than 20 books on Canadian political and economic history, and he has an award-winning uh, biography of C.D. Howe with the co-author, and he's uh, done a study of Pierre Trudeau's uh, foreign policy with, a, again, a co-author, and two major works on uh, the development of nuclear energy. So therefore, uh, he will tell you uh, his perspective right now, and we welcome him to the podium. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I uh, did once uh, write nuclear history. I was an official historian. Um, I wrote the official histories of what were then two crown corporations, uh, El Dorado Nuclear and um, the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. Um, both of these had prehistories, and if I'm considering the question of Atomic Canada, um, atomics in this country go back prior to nuclear weapons. Uh, they really go back to radium and to the medical uses of radium, which were universally recognized, greatly valued uh, in the 19-teens, 1920s. Um, the greatly valued part is the key, uh, because uh, radium was $75,000 a gram in the money of the 1930s. And uh, that was a very powerful argument in attracting the attention of uh, certain parts of the Canadian mining community, uh, led by a man named Gilbert Labine, who um, eventually ended up in the Canadian Business Hall of Fame. And whenever I feel really depressed and in need of a good laugh, I go down to the Canadian Business Hall of Fame and look at Gilbert's biography. Um, it's, uh, it's well known that uh, the definition of a Canadian mine is a hole in the ground with a liar on top, and Gilbert certainly met the criterion. Um, exploiting the work of uh, Government of Canada geologists, he discovered uh, a uranium deposit on the shores of Great Bear Lake in uh, Northwest Territories, and um, transformed his uh, failed gold mining company, El Dorado, uh, into um, a company that mined, mined uh, uranium. Um, uh, Gilbert didn't really know very much about how you uh, transmuted uranium into radium, so he uh, sent to Europe for an expert, uh, so we get um, scientific transmission to Canada. Uh, he found uh, a poor fellow uh, running a mine in Cornwall, England, uh, but he'd been trained by Madame Curie, whose name uh, opened many doors and uh, reassured investors. And so uh, this chap was brought over, and uh, Gilbert got into business. But the problem was that um, the uranium business, the radium business, was dominated by a company called the Union Minière du Haut-Katanga, uh, which um, mined... Uh, uranium in the Belgian Congo, in the world's uh, richest uranium mine, the richest ever. And um, they, uh, they also occasionally posed as the Belgian government. I really couldn't tell the dis difference between the Union Minière and the government of Belgium. Um, and they uh, very much wanted to keep their monopoly. So Gilbert ran into uh, international business in a major way and uh, faced bankruptcy in very short order because the Union Minière had the capacity to uh, lower the price of radium down to zero, uh, which certainly would have put El Dorado uh, out of business. So what did we do? Uh, we formed a cartel uh, with the Belgians and with a little bit of minor participation by the Czechs, 
and um, we marketed our uh, radium in that way uh, for the next couple of years until World War II broke out. Um, now, there was a sort of harbinger of World War II. Um, an order came through to El Dorado's head office at 80 King Street West, um, which uh, was interpreted on the invoice as our best ceramic grade uranium. Um, Gilbert had no idea what Columbia University wanted to do with this, but he assumed that they were getting into the pottery business. Um, so uh, El Dorado uranium uh, sailed off to Columbia University. There is some evidence that we also uh, sold to Germany. Um, the evidence is very sparse. Uh, the El Dorado records are very imperfect. Um, but the British government did notice it. Um, and you find tantalizing references in the guides to the files. Uh, however, um, the British government um, also has a records destruction policy where, whereby they destroy things they consider to be of no value and uh, trade generally meets that criterion. So uh, having uh, tracked down the necessary file number, it came up with uh, the stamp destroyed according to statute. So we'll never know whether El Dorado uranium uh, actually reached uh, Hitler's laboratories. But Union Minier uh, uranium certainly did. Uh, the Germans, of course, conquered Belgium in May 1940. Uh, that meant they got the um, uranium uh, refinery in uh, just outside of Antwerp. And that just left one uranium refinery outside German control. And that was uh, here in Canada uh, at Port Hope, Ontario, uh, where it was lodged in a disused um, seed and grain uh, warehouse. And it's still there. You can, uh, you can go down to uh, Port Hope and you can see it from the train. Uh, you can actually see some of the original buildings. And that was actually Canada's ticket of admission to the uh, nuclear club and um, to scientific transmission to Canada from more developed scientific establishments, richer countries, um, because Canada was valuable uh, in World War II and after, uh, not so much because we had um, scientists working on uh, nuclear questions, there were one or two, uh, but because we had that uranium uh, refinery. Now, we wouldn't really have known about this un unless the British had told us. Um, one day, a British emissary arrived in Ottawa where he uh, went to see the Prime Minister, Mackenzie King. And uh, Mackenzie King um, worshipped science. Um, I mean, it's the kind of attitude, I suppose, that historians studying science should have, but seldom do. But Mackenzie King just thought science was the cat's meow and the greatest thing, and Louis Pasteur was somebody that he had dinner with every other night in his dreams. And um, <coughs> seated, seated beside his dog, of course. Um, and so uh, King was just thrilled to find this representative of the British scientific establishment sitting before him in his office. And I interviewed this guy, and uh, he said well, it was one of those vivid memories of his life. Uh, there he was sitting in Mackenzie King's rather nice prime ministerial office, and he was explaining to him what the British wanted to do during the war. And he said, as I spoke, this look of horror crossed Mackenzie King's face as he grasped what I was telling him. And what he was telling him, of course, was that um, uh, Britain wanted to develop atomic weapons. He described their potential. He described the danger of Germany getting them first. Um, and uh, he said that, you know, this would be a, a triumph of science, which wasn't precisely how Mackenzie King saw it. Um, he turned it over to C.D. Howe, who was mentioned in uh, the introduction, who was Canada's Minister of Everything in 1942. Um, C.D. Howe is a graduate of MIT, actually a Massachusetts man, um, who came to Canada to teach at Dalhousie and then through various mutations, became the world's greatest constructor of grain elevators, an, an engineer. 
And um, Howe had put another engineer in charge of the National Research Council, Dr. C.J. McKenzie. And uh, McKenzie had been Howe's student, so you know, it shows that the way we do things today is still what we did in 1942. Uh, so um, the problem was turned over to Howe and McKenzie. McKenzie, uh, who had been dean of engineering at the University of Saskatchewan, did see the possibility that this would be um, a short circuit uh, to get Canada into something closer to the big leagues uh, in physics, chemistry, etc. Mackenzie very clearly saw this as being a great advantage to Canada. And um, so Canada provided um, a welcome refuge for a collection of uh, French and British scientists in 42, 43, 44, uh, centered in Montreal. Um, they were put in the unused buildings of the University of Montreal, which the university couldn't afford to complete. And uh, so we have the Montreal labs, and we have a cooperation and collaboration with the Manhattan Project uh, in the United States. Well, uh, to make a long story short, um, much of the progress of uh, British physics in the uh, late war period occurred here in Canada. What we had was essentially a British lab uh, with some Canadians attached, um, more as you got towards the engineering end of things. And um, the British constructed for us um, Canada's first uh, great reactor, uh, National Research Experimental, NRX, um, which was sited at uh, Chalk River. Now, the NRX was designed to be a plutonium factory. Um, you know, that's, that's what it did, um, or could have done. But along the way, because there was an exceptionally talented engineer from um, Imperial Chemicals, ICI, um, it was designed so as to produce also isotopes. And in a funny way, this, these two things are the links to Canada's atomic future after 1945. Um, the plutonium business never really worked out. Um, we tried because plutonium was valuable, and we saw it as a potential export to the United States. The Americans would pay for this. Everybody would be happy, and the scientists would have money to play with. Uh, but it didn't work. Uh, our adventures as a plutonium merchant uh, really uh, didn't work out. What turned out really to be valuable, of course, was the isotopes. Canada also uh, was a pioneer in nuclear accidents. Um, and the first really big one occurred at Chalk River. And uh, we were pioneers in learning how to cope with nuclear accidents. It was the law of unintended consequences working absolutely full blast. And that was where young Lieutenant Jimmy Carter um, had his first serious encounter with, uh, with nukes. He was handed a mop and given a stopwatch and told him, told that he could be in the room for precisely two minutes and he was to swab, which must have been one of the things he'd learned in the US Navy. So um, we had that, but we also had another example of unintended consequences. Um, the director of the Chalk River Lab was Dr. W.B. Lewis, a Brit uh, who had been sent over uh, by the British as a kind of peace offering when they withdrew their presence in Chalk River in 1947. Uh, and Lewis was a, a very religious man, a uh, very ethical man, very much uh, a man who believed in social responsibility. And he saw atomic energy as, as the key to human development. I mean, this was the magic potion uh, that would lift humankind from the miseries of poverty and ignorance, uh, pro providing energy for all. And uh, in cooperation with Dr. Homi Baba uh, from India, um, he proposed and the Indians accepted uh, that we would give the Indians a copy of NRX. And NRX, you know, really was a very good reactor. It lasted almost forever. And uh, it has had many beneficial consequences, but, you know, Lewis forgot the point that NRX is a plutonium factory. 
And um, the American plutonium plants, Savannah River, uh, are modeled on NRX very directly. And uh, the Indians got it. And, you know, it did play a role uh, in Indian nuclear development. And it helped make possible uh, the Indian eventual nuclear bomb. Well, one last thing that was brought up earlier in uh, preceding discussion, and that is the question of smaller powers and the acquisition of nuclear weapons. Um, and here, you know, one runs into, um, how, how can one call it, uh, the law of pompous history, or, you know, the idea that every big development has to have something really serious behind it. Um, Canada uh, decided not to pursue nuclear weapons uh, in December 1945. Um, it occurred uh, in about five minutes in the House of Commons in an evening session where the responsible minister, C.D. Howe, was having to defend his estimates, and Chalk River was a small part of it. And um, Howe, Howe stood up and said, well, you know, of course we're not going to develop nuclear weapons. And he sat down, and that was it. And I periodically get anxious questions from people saying, well, there must be more to it than that. And I think the answer is, well, no, there isn't. Um, why did Howe make the announcement? Well, first of all, uh, nuclear weapons were unbelievably expensive. New atomic development was unbelievably expensive. It would have taken up a large proportion, half of the budget of the Government of Canada, uh, and for that reason alone, he saw it as ridiculous, but he was also a very sensible engineer. And he had a very good idea of Canada's scientific and engineering base, and he knew that this particular project at that time was beyond our personnel capacity. Um, and finally, how is a man of his time? Canada had just been through World War II. Uh, we were part of an alliance. In that alliance, we had specific responsibilities, but subordinate responsibilities. And we relied on our larger allies uh, to provide some of the larger functions. That was just how we thought of it. And so it was natural to assume that Canada's international position after 1945 would be as part of an alliance, and part of an alliance in which the major responsibility would be with the United States uh, and, to a lesser extent, uh, Great Britain. Um, and that was, that was it. Um, the policy was never revoked. It was stated there. Um, occasionally, uh, ambitious scientists would come to the government of Canada. Dr. Oman Salant, for example, later Chancellor of U of T, um, did have the idea that he might like to have a nuclear weapon in his... Uh, uh, in his briefcase, um, and that too was rejected. How was still part of the government, and it was treated with the scorn uh, that I think it deserved. So it's this is a very brief introduction to nuclear Canada and how it came to be. Um, you will have noticed that much of the causation is absolutely accidental or coincidental. Uh, that was, however, I think how it happened. It did fit in a larger context. Uh, larger context of Western culture, Western science, and it fitted as well Canada's self-image as a developing country, which was still very strong in the 1940s, and atomic energy was part of it. 